Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am happy to be with you for another episode of this podcast, talking about books. As I mentioned at the end of the last episode, I have another author interview today, this time with returning author Jasmine Silvera. Jasmine was here almost exactly a year ago, just a little bit under a year, to talk about her debut novel, which was called Death Stancer. That is episode 17, if you're interested in checking that out. We, um, she now has released her second author, excuse me, her second book, Dancer's Flame, and that just came out on April 24th. So she is so much fun to talk to. I'm so excited she came back, and we'll be getting to that interview in just a few moments. Before we do that, we'll have a little bit of housekeeping uh, to take care of. As always, not as always, as often is the case. I have copies of this book, Dancer's Flame, to give away in a giveaway. So if you stay tuned to the end of the podcast, I'll tell you how you can go about entering into the contest to possibly win a copy of Dancer's Flame. You really should enter if you are a fan of romance, of contemporary urban fantasy, of really great strong women um, fe- fe- excuse me, strong women females, strong women <laughs> protagonists, um, great family connections. There's just a lot to love about this book, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, in terms of giveaways, I realize that I talk about giveaways and I announce the winners on our social media, but I tend to not do that here, which is very silly. Mondays are our giveaway days, and um, it's so much fun to announce the winners and then send up books off out into the world. They're not even my books. I can't even imagine what the authors feel when they send their little babies out into the world. I get so excited sending their little babies out into the world. Here, read this book. I, I sort of know this author. I talked to them, and they're fabulous. And now, please, please read this book. And yeah, I'm a book nerd, and I love it. Um, so yesterday, Monday, was another giveaway day, and I gave away copies of My Oxford Year by Julia Whalen, who was on the podcast a couple weeks ago, as well as A Cruel Kind of Beautiful by Michelle Hazen, also on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. So um, it was the same week, obviously, so the giveaways go by week. And congratulations to Rachel, Jen, Vita, and Deborah for their winning their copies of those books. So thank you for entering. Thank you for listening and keep entering. I love sending these books out into the world. So that is my little spiel on the giveaways. Again, stay tuned to the end to find out how to enter to win a copy of Dancer's Flame. So Dancer's Flame, as I said, is the second in the Grace Bloods series and it is takes place after Death's dancer, uh, just a couple of weeks after actually. So the description on the back is the, as follows. With the help of a god, Azrael and Azela exposed a conspiracy and altered the world's balance of power. But for Azrael, victory comes with dangerous new abilities he can't control. Will embracing his future mean losing everything he's gained? His allies, his territory, his consort? Azela's found a home when if Azela's found a home when she stepped into Azrael's protection and his arms. But if accepting her new role as consort means giving up the life she's worked for, will the price be too high? When an impossible creature shows up in Prague bearing a dire warning, the search for answers divides them. Now Azela must forge a bond with the power within her while Azrael fights to keep from tearing himself apart, and time is running out. Gods don't forget or forgive especially a betrayal from one of their own. 
So there is lots of drama going on. One thing that I really love about this book is that it is after the happily ever after. Um, they they wrapped things up pretty well, taking care of the th- what threatened them in the first book, Azrael and Azella. But there, you could tell that there was lots more that that needed to happen, and. There's things that um, will be explained in terms of Azella's family and Azriel's Aegis and his pro- progeny. There's lots more stories to be told, and this is a series, the Grace Bloods series, as I said. But, you know, you had kind of that big climactic finish where they, Azriel and Azella, came together, realized that they love each other, etc., as often happens in romance. But then what we don't often see in romance is, okay, so now what? You had the big dramatic moment, you realized that you loved each other, and now you have to figure out how to live together. And for most couples, that can be complicated enough, but for Azriel and Azella, they've got a few other things that make it a little more difficulty, difficult. Um, Azella has new powers that she didn't in the book in the last book, but she's still also got a very complicated family that they are trying to figure out their relationship with. Azrael is an immortal necromancer. I find being married to my lovely, wonderful human husband challenging enough some days. I'm not sure how I would be in a relationship with an immortal necromancer. So here you get what happens in the happily ever after, or at least some of what happens. But you also get a lot of adventure. You get them trying to figure out not only their relationship with each other, but as the book description says, the new powers that they both have and how to manage those and how to figure out how they fit in their lives, etc. There's a lot more of Azella's family. And I know a lot of you who read the first book really love Azella's family and what's not to love. They are fabulous. They are a family of witches and werewolves. The uh, mom, Zella's mom is a witch. Um, All her daughters-in-law are witches and her sons are all werewolves. There are three of them. So three werewolf sons married to three witch daughters-in-law. Again, I love my family dearly and we get along very well, but I can't imagine, I can't quite imagine dealing with family matters (laughs) and <laughs> your whole family is supernatural. So all kinds of fun things happening in this book. I loved it. I love talking to Jasmine. And I'm going to get to that interview now because she is so much fun to talk to. And I hope you enjoy listening to her as much as I do. So here is my interview with Jasmine Silvera about the second book in her Grace Bloods series called Dancer's Flame. Hi, Jasmine. Welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. It is wonderful to have you here. Um, This is your second time on the podcast. So uh, for people who might not have heard the first interview, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Yeah, thank you so much for having me back. I had so much fun the first time. Me too. um, And it's delightful to be back here with you again. Uh, So I'm Jasmine Silvera. I'm the author of the Grace Blood series. Um, The first book, Death's Dancer uh, is out. Uh, The second book, Dancer's Flame, was just released on the 24th of April. Um, So we're fresh in the release mode for that one. Uh, And they are a set of romantic urban fantasy books that are set in the city of Prague in an alternate present day um, in a world where ruled by necromancers, uh, where humans are able to communicate with gods through dance. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's a lot in the hopper, but it's basically... Uh, the series revolves around one dancer who is hired uh, to do a job for a very powerful necromancer and gets caught up in their world um, and has an amazing adventure and winds up falling in love. Um, and so the second book is about, it's sort of after the happily ever after of the first book um, and how our two main characters, spoiler alert, Azrael and Azella, manage their relationship um, and then deal with some of the ramifications of what happened in the first book. Right. So is that, I hope that's not too super vague. <laughs> well, you don't want to give too much away. Um, is yeah, I mean, obviously you have a you have a new book out that came out on the the twenty fourth. But is, anything else new since we last spoke on the podcast? Oh my gosh, yeah. I feel like um, it's been almost a year, and um, it's uh, we moved again, which oh, is kind of funny because <laughs> you were moving the, the last, last time. time we were talking. <laughs> yeah, 
exactly. And to be fair, actually, this is hilarious. So the, we, after our first conversation, we had just moved in uh, to a rental that we thought we were going to be in for a long time. And then we found a house that we were able to buy. So oh, nice. we, I think within about six weeks, packed up and moved everything over again. So oh my gosh. We're, we're here now. We're not going anywhere. Um, and we've been in our house about a year, and so it's been really exciting. After traveling a lot and living in various places, it's nice to kind of have a place to settle down for a little while. Yeah, congrats. That's awesome. Thank you. So um, you're done moving. Um, <laughs> so yes, let's, let's talk. Forever. <clears throat> forever. Oh, don't, don't say that. Don't, don't say it. <laughs> never say never. I should knock on wood. Yeah, right? exactly. Um, let's talk a little bit about your books. Uh, I guess that's, that's why we're here. Um, so yeah. uh, you, you gave us kind of a brief intro to Dancer's Flame, but uh, can you tell us a little bit about the story? Yeah, so um, the two, the protagonist, Zella, uh, she's a dancer. She's human, um, and she's been trained in classical dance in this style and technique of dance called God's dancing, and that basically allows humans to communicate with the gods and draw on their power um, to for her patrons. She's basically hired to choreograph a dance, perform the dance, and then there's a request placed in the language of the dance that then benefits the person who hires her. Um, so in the last book, she was brought in by this necromancer, Azrael, to help boost his power as he was trying to hunt down a killer. Um, and chaos ensued. Um, and so they wound up uncovering a really large conspiracy within the group that rules the world and sort of shaking up the power dynamic. And also they wound up together as a couple. So the second book picks up pretty much right after, I would say a couple of weeks after the end of the first. Um, and through the ending conflict in the first book, Azella has been changed kind of irre- irrevocably. She is no longer fully human, um, although I'll sort of save the why or how. Uh, and she's also now starting this fresh relationship with a very powerful 2,000-year-old necromancer. Um, and so... You know, as anyone who's been in any sort of long-term relationship knows, that some the challenge of staying together sometimes is just as exciting as the challenge of getting together. Right. Um, so this kind of handles that aspect. And then in terms of the world that they're involved in, um, Azrael, who is a, one of the most powerful necromancers in the world, his personal quest has always been to discover, like, how necromancers came into the world. Um, and their counterparts are witches. So this they're kind of one operates on the life end of the spectrum and the other operates on the death end of the spectrum. And so his goal has always been to figure out, well, how did they get here and why are they powerful and where does the power come from? And so as he and Azella have sort of inadvertently shifted the world quite a bit, he is now drawn back into this quest to figure this out. So, um, and at the same time, his powers are evolving and changing because of, uh, the way that they resolved the conflict in the last book. And so he's now, he thought he was in control of himself and everything, and it turns out he has a little less control than he thinks he does, um, and that his, he's a little shaky. So um, this also book also brings back uh, the characters of his Aegis, which are his guard. So over time, he's assembled this sort of supernatural cohort of soldiers that are like protection and um also sort of help him through his counsel and they help him, you know, execute his big plans. Um, and so Gregor, Lesepi, uh, the dead gang is all back. And then on the other side of things, um, Isella's family, who is actually a huge fan favorite. I'm so delighted that people love her family as much as they do. Um, and so her family is back. And so we're going to get a little bit more of the Vogels uh, and the Vogel pack, which are her brothers mm-hmm. in book two. I'm going to jump in here so we can take our first break of the podcast, but there is lots more of this interview with Jasmine and lots more of this world, this alternate Prague and um, Azella and Azrael. There's lots more to come. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. 
always on the go, but the day just won't be one without your Hollywood fix. Let Golden State Media Concepts Entertainment Podcast take care of that. Jordan and Keith is Entertainment Tonight meets Access Hollywood. I'm Jordan. The guy laughing, that's Keith. <laughs> yeah, I'm Keith. An all-inclusive look of pop culture. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Jasmine Silvera about the second in her Grace Blood series called Dancer's Flame. Let's go ahead and get right back to that interview. So you said it's set in alternate Prague, which it is. Basically, everything is the same. You know, I mean, it's it's modern times. People have cell phones. Everything is the same. But then you've got this other world. Um, Can you talk a little bit about how that other world evolved how you um how you how you what what was your inspiration and then how you kind of developed that world sure so um i love dance i'm a, I'm a terrible dancer yeah. but i love it uh i do a little salsa dance and i i actually started taking an adult beginner ballet class um after the first book came out because i was so drawn back into this world um so i love dance and i love movement um i used to teach yoga and i may still get back to that at some day but i've always been entranced with the idea that Dancing is a form, can potentially be a form of communication. And in many cultures, um, there are specific dancers, I think, like off the top of my head, um, like hula, that actually tell stories. Um, and so that kind of became my, I've always wanted to incorporate movement and dance into a book and a story. And that sort of became my, uh, my inspiration on that end. And then living, I lived in Prague for about two years and I, um, as I was living there, I read a lot about the city and I learned about the history. And it's always had this um, kind of mystical or esoteric uh, aspect to it. Um, there was an Emperor Rudolph who, uh, who uh, was fascinated with alchemy and all matter of esoteric things and magic. And so um, the city itself just has a very, it's got lots of great old funny stories about people who claim to be able to do all sorts of magical things, um, alchemists and sorcerers. And a lot of these people were proto-scientists, basically. But um, at the time, what they were doing was so unusual. It, you know, what is this? There's that quote about things, something technological, technological advances when you don't understand them or I'm going to butcher this quote, <laughs> basically. But once something is so advanced, it's indistinguishable from magic. Right. right? So, right. Uh, so all these things kind of came together in my head as I was thinking about the city and I was living there. Um, and I just thought, well, what if, you know, I kind of plucked a random moment in time, um, you know, uh, and thought about what if, uh, like, maybe around the 70s, 80s, as, People were beginning to, you know, there's a, I watched the X-Files a lot. Mm-hmm. And there's the idea that at some point the governments became involved in um, things like telepathy and telekinesis and how do we, how do we weaponize these esoteric skills? Mm-hmm. And so I thought, well, wow, what if, what if that happened with dance? Like, what if we learned that if we could dance a certain way, we could, you know, draw on some power greater than our own and how would humans have used that? And unfortunately, my decision was that they were going to use it against each other. And so basically, the whole world building shift supposes that from the mid 80s, there was a God's war. So for two or three weeks, um, the human human governments threw weapons of the gods at each other um, until a powerful group of necromancers stepped in and said, hey, you guys are out of control. We're in charge now. Uh, and the reason that you're going to fear us is because we can control whether you live or die. And if we don't want you to die or we want to punish you, we can turn you into our zombies, our personal servants. So they sort of divvied up the world between them. Um, they decided that they were going to control the god dancing, and so there would be no other dancing outside of their sort of uh, permission permissions given. Uh, and then, And so that basically is my little shift of the world. But I wanted to see... I have this idea that it, it may be a, a big shift like that might not change some of the day-to-day things that we experience. So yeah, like there'd still be cell phones and mm-hmm. some of the same brands of things and cars and a lot of things would continue on as we sort of know them. 
with just this slight shift. Um, and I, you know, I will see how successful it is. Uh, people really seem to enjoy the first book, and I hope that uh, the second is just as entertaining. But I like seeing familiar things in unfamiliar ways, so um, that was my kind of inspiration for the world building. Yeah, thank you. This is slightly random, but the book is in Prague. Is the, um, is there any possibility that there will be um, a Czech version of the series, a, translate, a translation of the series? That would be a dream of mine. Actually, um, we are looking now at translations. Um, I don't, I have uh, some connections uh, in the Czech Republic and we're trying to figure out how that would work. Um, I would also like to have it translated into German. Um, half of my family is in Germany and so it would be great. And they're all really excited about the book and, um, but you know, very, with varying degrees of reading it. So uh, I would like to do translation. I'm also looking at an audiobook version of it um, in the near future because I think that uh, I know personally I've gotten more into audiobooks as my life has gotten busier and um, I'm chasing a small person. It's a little bit easier for me to find time to listen to a story than it is to sit down with a book. So those are the things I have planned for the future, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Um, w would you narrate or do you want somebody else to narrate? Oh, I probably would have somebody else narrate. It's very hard for me to listen to my own voice. <laughs> um, <laughs> as odd as that sounds. No, no, I understand. Uh, I, and, I, I, and I'm a very ambitious writer. I mean, I have characters with various accents who are from various places and various points in time. And uh, I don't think I have the theatrical chops to manage the cast that I wrote. Uh, but... Uh, I'm sure there is someone quite capable of doing an excellent job with that. Yes, there's some really, not me. really amazing <laughs> narrators out there. Um, so back to the story, uh, you've talked a little bit about Izella and Azrael. What about them do you think resonates with readers? Oh, you know, I think um, I set out to write, I love paranormal romance and urban fantasy. And so I really, and one of the things that was kind of tricky for me is the, the power dynamic because you have one very powerful, generally immortal or long lived creature and a, a human. Um, and so uh, I, I love that dynamics either really works in some series or it really doesn't. And I, I really wanted to have a take on it that I felt could possibly be as equitable as possible, um, given the sort of built in issues in the dynamic. Um, and so, you know, what I like that people seem to have responded well to is the way that Azella stands her ground and is kind of has a, a sense of humor um, in her approach to him and doesn't allow things takes doesn't think take things too seriously. I mean, I think also um, Azrael is likable because he is a powerful kind of. I don't know. I I I waver back and forth on this whole alpha hero, alpha male thing. Um, but my idea for him is that he's old enough that he would have been around. Um, maybe toward the tail end of some of the matrilineal civilizations in the world. So he is not himself unfamiliar with being around powerful women. He surrounds himself and his court with um, some very powerful entities like Lesepi, who is an Amazon, or descended from Amazon. I mean, his mentor um, was another very powerful female necromancer. So I, I wanted to have him, while being a very masculine man, also be very kind of have an innate respect for uh, femininity and the and strength of women. And so, um, you know, I, I don't, that's, I wouldn't say that's maybe explicit on the page, but I think it comes out in the way that they relate to each other. And that seems to be something that people respond well to the way their relationship feels. Um, I've heard mature and I've heard, um, you know, well developed or they communicate with each other. Uh, and so I, I think it's hard to know <laughs> Um, exactly what people, what resonates with them, but I might be the wrong person to ask, but uh, people do seem to like them a lot, and I, I, I that's great, and I think that's why. Right, and what I, one thing I appreciate about their story is so often in this type of of book, paranormal romance, and as you said, usually there's a very big power differential. One is kind of ancient and immortal, one is human. Um, so often things feel forced it, it almost you know there's there's often a well you i have found you you are my soulmate and so now i will just force you to be my soulmate whether you want to or not 
<laughs> and that yeah, is yeah. not present here. So I appreciate that. Oh, thank you so much. I think, um, you know, there is that element. And I know there's, you know, I don't want to put down that this idea of the faded mate, you right. know, because I think there's something very sexy about like, you're attracted to somebody you don't know why, and it turns out you're meant to be together. And I, I mean, I, I like that. And I respect that as a trope when it's done well. Um, but for me personally, um, gosh, there was an article I read by, you know, Dan Savage, if you've heard of him, mm-hmm. he's a yeah. relationship columnist. He wrote something about this idea that you, you know, you're choosing your partner constantly, that being with somebody is a choice and it's a choice you're making every day. And, and you have to, at some point, choose the person over the things that you don't like or don't understand about the person. Or, right. You know, like there is, the reality is, is that it's wonderful to have somebody that you feel attached to, but nobody's perfect and that you, you still have to choose them every day. And I, wanted to make it clear that although Azrael and Azella, like he does offer her this role as his, his consort basically for her protection originally, because it, it gives her certain protections against the world, but they don't have to take it to a relationship level. Um, and they do. And so they are constantly, the two of them are ha- constantly having to choose each other and say, yeah, we're going to, we're going to stay together and we're going to figure this out and we're going to make this work. Um, and that pops up a couple of times in the second book too, as his powers begin to change and his control shifts a little. I mean, the dynamic is a lot more even now in some respects because she's become quite powerful. Um, and so they, I do want them to have to continue to look at each other and say yes to this, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, and their relationship. So cool. I'm glad that that resonated for you. That's good to know. Thank you. Well, and it's interesting because often, you know, the the story after the happily ever after, you you know, it involves, it involves discussing money and where we're going to live and how we're going to integrate our families. And for (laughs) Azriel and Azella, there's there's some of that with families, but you know, more, it's more of how are we going to deal with the fact that people want to kill you and (laughs) you are seen as a threat, yeah. you know, <clears throat> so slightly different yeah, relationship so that's problems. Where my, that's where my, my writer brain kicks in. <laughs> yes, I mean, we all know the realities are a lot more mundane right. than whether or not a group of powerful ma- necromancers wants to kill or control you. Right. Um, so I, you know, well, that I'm happens to, to me create, every day. Uh, all right. Well, yeah, I don't know about you, but <laughs> honestly, just the other day, this group of witches. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think that's where you take what you know. And as a writer, I was this old thing that everybody's, write what you know. But, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know necromancers, and right. I don't know witches, and I don't know any werewolves. Right. So there's that. Um, but I do know relationships, and I do know what it's like to be, to you know, again, choose your partner and stay with that person and choose to have a life together. So it's really just taking that element that I know and then stacking on top of it, the supernatural element of this world, obviously for them where they're going to live and, you know, who gets to put their shoes on the left side of the closet is less important um, because the, the world is a lot different. So I'm trying to give them challenges that are commiserate with their relationship as you know uh, those of us mundane people our challenges are you know who did you clean your shaving clippings out of the sink after you <laughs> finished your face that kind of thing uh-huh. um, so they're just trying to like you, yeah you just take what you know uh, and then you stack the world building on top of it right i love it um so the, the it just came out on the 24th, so just a couple of weeks. What kind of events do you have planned or have you done with this release? Well, I'm doing this amazing podcast interview with this podcaster <laughs> who I just adore, named Sarah. Oh, uh-huh. is that you? That's me. Oh, um, hey. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, so um, aside from this wonderful podcast, which I'm delighted to be on again, I'm actually having a live event here in Seattle. Uh, with a friend of mine and fellow author um, named Ariel Meadowstalling at the uh, Ada's Technical Bookshop on Capitol Hill. So this is Seattle. So sorry, I know you guys are all over the world listening to this. But if you are in Seattle, the Pacific Northwest, um, on May 8th, we're going to do a book launch party. And we've decided to, rather than do the traditional launch party um, of just me reading from the book and maybe answering some questions, but actually have a conversation about um, romance as a genre um, feminism as a genre, as a uh, as a philosophical concept, and how both how they work together, or don't, or can they, um, and really just turn it into a conversation. I mean, I am a writer, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, um, I'm a feminist, 
Uh, and I also write romance novels, and I don't think that those things are um, exclus- the exclusivity part is beginning to break down between them. And I really feel that um, some of the most powerful work in uh, feminism can be done in fiction, and especially in, in a genre that centers relationships and, uh, the, you know, the woman's perspective in a relationship and, you know, women striving for and getting what they need in their lives, careers, relationships. So um, I'm proud to be both feminist and a romance writer. Uh, and uh, so we're going to incorporate that a little bit into our event. So that's Monday the 8th. That's just coming Tuesday. Oh, my gosh, I'm so not ready. <laughs> uh, about 6 p.m. at Ada's. And we're, you know, they are doing some pre-sale tickets for people who need or would like to have guaranteed seats, and you can do that with or without a book purchase. Um, but those are going fast. So if it's something that you think you might want to go to, uh, the links to all of that will be up on my page. Uh, and actually, I'm not even sure when this is going to air, so this might be information that we don't even need. Tuesday, Sarah, actually. So it, it, it's the oh, same perfect. day as the event. So <laughs> Perfect. All right. All right. So, yeah, so that's the big event. Um, and then the book is, again, um, it's going to be at the Third Place Books. Uh, on the shelves, and it's also on the shelves at Ada's Technical Books on Capitol Hill. And so those are kind of my big, my big news events for this particular release. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Seems like a good time to just jump in here so we can take our second break of the podcast. But stay tuned, more is to come. So you're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Before the break, Jasmine was talking about the event that she has coming up today, which is very exciting. If you're in the Seattle area, you should definitely go check that out. If you aren't in the Seattle area, don't despair. There are other ways that you can be part of this action, uh, the debut novel action, as well as forthcoming information on Jasmine's books. Um, So she's about to talk about that right now. I'll let her explain it. And uh, for the people that aren't in the Seattle area, will there be any part of it like Facebook live or any way they can they can participate yeah so um, I did do some Facebook live events on the week of the release uh, I invite you if you're interested in participating in releases in the future to join um, I have a Facebook group called the Academy uh, which is named affectionately after the dance Academy that Azella was trained at in the book um, and so I do all of my release stuff around in and around that group like for this particular release all the original members of the group um, got uh, a paperback, fine paperback copy of the book. Um, so that's the kind of thing that I like to do. The group is, it's a little bit it's less of an action team than just a group of us. We all hang out and share memes and talk dance and grammar and whatever weird thing is making us laugh this week. Um, so that's probably the best place to hang out if you're into getting release news and information and when events online happen. But I do about once a week do a Facebook Live um, on my page uh, and that just kind of updates, updates everybody on the status and I'll maybe do a giveaway. Um, so that's definitely, if you're into getting free books or swag or whatever, that, that's probably the best place to tap in is um, the Facebook page or the Facebook group. And I can give, um, announce those or put those up at some point however you'd like to do that yeah and i'll put that all on the um there's a blog now there wasn't a blog when we we talked last time so all your information will go on the post the blog post that accompanies this episode cool yeah cool um 
So when we talked last time, uh, we just had the one book. It wasn't yet a series. Now it is a series and it's called The Grace Bloods. So can you talk a little bit about where that name comes from? Yeah, so like I said, the um, Azrael's search for their identity as a, where they fit into the world um, is around where they come from. And so as it is sort of uncovered, and I'm trying to think, I'm, I don't think this is a spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> it is now, it isn't now. But um, the idea is that uh, the gods, or these powerful entities who uh, that humans call on for, for their help, actually have mingled with humans. And through that mingling... Uh, their blood or their whatever makes them special and magical in our world is mingled with humans. And that is the idea is that if you have this blood, it's like grace, um, and the, the grace of this blood gives you powers. And so you either wind up as a necromancer or a witch or perhaps you're some other supernatural creature. Um, and so I, because the series incorporates not just the necromancers, but the witches, um, there are some shifters, there are some other supernatural creatures. Um, I wanted a series title that incorporated all of those. Um, that way we could talk about everybody in this world. And, um, and the grace blood, these creatures are all called, they consider themselves grace blooded. They have the blood of the gods in their veins. Um, and this grace gives them the powers that they have. Okay, thank you. And um, yeah. how many books do you, do you have a plan for how many books you would like to have in the series? Yeah, I'd like to close the series probably with four. I have, uh, and then a couple of novellas that are related. Um, uh, the next book is going to be Gregor's book. So uh, those of you who are fans of Azrael's Left Hand Man of Darkness. <laughs> yeah, um, he is. I'm both intrigued and frightened to know more about Gregor. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know. He's, he's one of those that I was really worried people wouldn't like, but actually I've, have, I've had the total opposite response. So um, I, I invid- at first I wanted his book to come next, but I uh, had stuff I needed to get out for the world. Uh, and so I thought, let's just stay with Azella and Azrael for one more. Um, and uh, so Gregor is a, uh, he's a Hessian soldier. So he's basically around since the Civil War in the U.S. Or, um, excuse me, the Revolutionary War in the U.S. And uh, he is a German soldier who is one of the mercenaries who were brought in uh, to fight um, the colonists. And so uh, he is my taciturn, very handsome, uh, kind of deadly uh, super warrior. And he is Azrael's second in command. And so uh, in the first book, he gives Zella a run for her money. Uh, and the second book, there's a little bit that comes out about his relationship to her and her family. And so um, the third book, I'm very excited, will be totally his focus. It's going to bring us back to the U.S. Um, hmm. And it will follow him as he uh, meets a second character um, who's basically his counterpart in the American Necromancer's Court. And uh, they go on their adventure, and, and we'll then kind of wind up back in Prague. That's really exciting. Like I said, I'm I'm both frightened and intrigued and excited about um, Gregor's story because as a character, I find him interesting, maybe a little off-putting. So it'll be good to get some backstory and get some insight into his character. When does that book come out? Oh, that will be coming out toward the end of this year, actually. That one, that one is almost done. Okay. Um, we had a long gap between the first and the second book and this time, but the, the third book is, I'm getting it out to you by the end of the year. That's <laughs> okay, sure. good. Yeah. Okay. And there was also a short story that came out in, I think the collection was called Summer Solstice, or was that, that, was the, was that the short story? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a short story. Yeah, that one came out there. That was um, a group of authors that are also were published originally with Kindle Press. Uh, we put together a series of anthologies that were seasonally based, so they're all named after um, an equinox or a solstice. And then the idea was that we would use the characters from our, our world in, somehow in relation to this idea of the season. And so uh, Gregor features pretty prominently in the short story, Best Served Cold, um, also, Isella's oldest brother, Mark, uh, is in that story as well. Um, and they have a little bit of a mini adventure of their own. Um, not a romantic adventure. Uh, <laughs> Mark is married, <laughs> I should say. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, yeah, so that's that. Yeah, so there is a short story. So that will sort of tie in a little bit of some of the external stuff going on around um, the first or the second book and sort of leading us into book three. Yeah. Right. 
Right. And how about Izella's family? Are we going to get more of their backstory as the series goes on? Oh, absolutely. I love me some bubbles. Um, so actually what started, I was going to have a couple of little related novellas that came out around the series. Um, and so this last year for NaNoWriMo, I decided, well, let's, uh, Izella has three brothers, uh, two older, one younger, um, and her parents also live in Prague. And so I sort of thought it would be fun because the the brothers are all sort of paired off and settled down by the time uh, Death Dancer takes place. And so I kind of thought it would be fun to explore their backstories a little bit and how they got to where they were. Uh, so I decided to just write a quick little 50,000-word novella uh, about the three brothers. Well, it turned into 90,000 words about Tobias and Bibi. <laughs> so, oh, jeez. <laughs> and Barbara. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so, um, I have decided that we're going to go ahead and just do three, a spinoff series. that will be a little spinoff, a little prequel, um, that will center just around the brothers because, um, the brothers, I, I'm going to go ahead and little spoiler, plug, plug your ears for 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> the brothers are werewolves. <gasps> okay. Unplug your ears. <laughs> okay. Then we count to 30. Uh, and so the idea is that it gets to how they all became comfortable with who they are and what they are. And um, then you see them sort of in full power by the time uh, Death, uh, Death Dancer comes along. Yeah. So there will definitely be more Vogels. I'm really excited. I love uh, the relationship between Beryl, their mother, and the three boys is probably one of my favorite things to write ever. Um, I'm having so much fun with them because she's got three very strong-willed, non-human sons. And so she's a real tough lady, and I just love writing her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they uh, – so, yeah, it's it's – She's a witch. We we've, we we know that. Um, she uh, her children are werewolves. <laughs> her sons are werewolves, and then there's yeah. Zella, who yeah. originally was just kind of normal, but now she's involved. Their family has got some. Um, they, they don't have the normal family dynamics <laughs> of. Uh, no, they don't. And again, it's it's the write what you know, and then add something extraordinary to it. You mm-hmm. know, like I I I have a big family. Um, I don't. I, I have one sibling. Uh, and then some cousins that are very close to. It. Let's add the supernatural element to it. You know, I don't. None of my family that I know of are witches. Well, but, <laughs> that you they've know. mentioned. Hey, let's let's add. See if we can add that and that and that tension of how they're all trying to relate to each other as siblings and also having this pretty big secret because they are existing in a world that. Um, they would be in big trouble if they were public about who they are. You know, so. Um, she kind of added that to it too. That was fun. Yeah, and then the other thing that I appreciate about um, the family and Isella as a main character is that you don't often get women of color in main roles in contemporary urban fantasies. So that's really fun. Um, I appreciate that element. Not that it's a huge focus. It's just you know it just is, but it's it's good to see more diversity represented in books in fantasy books. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I mean, I, um, I'm a woman of color. Uh, I am of uh, African American descent, and we're quite mixed um, on my mom's side of my family. So um, it's very much like my family in some ways, I feel like looks like Azella's does. Um, and I didn't, and I love urban fantasy, I love romance, paranormal romance, and I didn't see myself or my family represented um, when I started reading it, certainly. And so for me, it didn't feel like a question when I started to write my own that um, the characters would sort of look like my experience and reflect some of that experience. And I think, um, you know, one of the, as I went looking for people, because I like to look at, uh, I spend a lot of time on Pinterest, picking out people who look like my characters or would incorporate elements of my characters. And one of the big inspirations for Azella was, um, a dancer named Misty Copeland, who is um, the first black prima ballerina at the American Ballet Theater. Uh, and it's a huge landmark. I mean, ballet is a very elite world. It's exclusive. It's very, and the training is difficult. It's uh, very intense. And it, and there are very few women of color that are participating, although that number is growing. Oh, and actually, I shouldn't say that. I think there have always been lots of women of color participating in ballet, and reaching this level has been much harder. But, you know, it's, if it's not visible, you don't know it's there. Right. Um, and so I really, so I, as I read more about her and her story, and then I discovered, like, sites like Brown Girls Do Ballet, and um, 
and all of these things, I just felt like this, it was very easy for me to have an inspiration for her that was a real person. I'm like, I'm not making this up. <laughs> there is a woman who is an incredible dancer. Um, and yes, she doesn't command the power of God through dance. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe she does. Maybe she does. We um, don't know. But it's, it, you know, I'm not making it up, basically. Uh, and so it was nice to have a real live person to draw some inspiration from. Uh, and then as I found one, there were many, many others. Um, and I, it just is important to me that my books and the world of my books reflect um, on some basic level the world that I live in. You know, um, Azella's Friends group is a very diverse group. Um, they're from all over the world. You know, it's been my experience through travel um, and living internationally that, that there are people from all over the world everywhere, that it's not necessarily one group of people who does all the travel and experience and adventure in the world. Um, and so I wanted somebody coming along behind me who maybe didn't see herself in a book to look at this character um, and recognize something familiar. So, so thank you, because it means a lot to me to be able to uh, bring this character to life. Absolutely. Uh, it is time now for our third and final break of the podcast. So when we come back, Jasmine's going to be talking a little bit about the book cover for Dancer's Flame. We talked about the book cover for Death's Dancer on the first podcast, and the, the covers really are beautiful, and she was very involved in how they look and how they turned out. So it's fun to hear the process on that. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Want to know the latest and hottest music hidden the airwaves? Don't be left out. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Music Podcast. Keith keeps you on the loop with everything you need to know from pop, rock, hip-hop, and the top 40, and we'll throw in news of your favorite artists, concert and tour dates, and so much more. Listen no further, because this is the gold standard in music podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Jasmine Silvera. Our conversation before the break made me think of the um, the book cover, which uh, the the first book cover had kind of a silhouette of Isella dancing, and this new book has, um, they're both beautiful covers. We talked a little bit about it that last time, but um, a very prominent kind of photo of uh, Isella. Um, talk a little bit about the book cover this book cover uh, did were you as involved as you were with the first one yeah so um i uh, both book covers i have directed um i don't design myself but i have definitely done the direction for them um, because it was very important to me that the dancer be represented properly on the cover um azella uh and the first book cover i struggled i mean we had such a struggle to find um Stock photography. So like a lot of authors, I rely on stock photography sites for my covers. Um, and this is why, you know, readers, little little bit of thing, you see a model on a, a cover and then you see that model on another cover, um, very likely that's because it's a stock photo that was used by two different designers. And the way stock photography works is that unless you pay for the exclusive rights, which tend to be very expensive, you are actually paying just to use the the non-exclusive use rights. So anybody else can also use that same picture. Um, so in my case, I just had an impossible time trying to find um, a photo of an African-American dancer for the first book. And so what I wound up doing was finding a professional photographer who, who had done some shoots with uh, dance companies like Alvin Ailey and other companies that had dancers of color um, and licensing one of his photos. So that's, and that picture was just so gorgeous. I mean, that leap was like, mm -hmm. oh, you, know, yeah. you know, and I sent it to the designer and he was like, yes, that's the one. Um, so the second time around though, I got really incredibly lucky. I mean, I was ready. I had my, my, I was pulling up my contact and for the photographer who does dancers. I was ready to find someone. And I, kind of sent my first thoughts to the designer and I said, oh, it'd be nice to have both of them on the cover this time um, and, and to see both of them. Like the dynamic in the first book is he's very mysterious and powerful, so he's kind of above and mysterious. And I sort of wanted this book to be a little bit more feature both of them or her. Uh, and 
uh, we just got lucky. I don't, my cover designer is amazing. He found this, this is a stock photo of a, of this model who was like the minute I saw her, I was like, Oh yes, that's her. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I it was. It was there was no question. I had thought about doing um, because this book is less about the dancing and more about her becoming kind of stepping into her new role and her new power. So it was less important to put a dancer on the cover. But yeah, I mean it, that was a huge moment. And I think there's been a recognition um, in the industry and especially and even in stock photographers that there is a desire for people of color uh, to have to be featured on books, especially if that's the main character. So I'm seeing personally a lot more variety in the stock photography. And I think that you're starting to see that reflected in the book covers. Um, there've been some really beautiful ones that are out there that are really reflective of the diversity of the world that we live in. And that's really exciting. So yeah. I'm happy to be and delighted to be part of that uh, in, in some tiny way. And I, uh, yeah, I'm totally in love with my covers. I have to say I, I, all kudos to the designer for that. Yeah. yeah. Yep. They're beautiful. Your most recent newsletter article, uh, you talked about playlists. Uh, and when you're writing, you often have playlists. What? Um, so that sounds kind of like a, a bit of a ritual that you have around your writing. What other rituals do you have? It sounds like you spend some time on Pinterest. Can you talk a little bit about what other things go into your writing that help you to focus? Oh, absolutely. So, um, I've gotten a lot less precious than I used to be as a baby writer. Um, when I was single and childless and writing, uh, there was a lot of like rituals around having the right cup of tea or coffee or being in the right location or the right time of day and the sun slanting just perfectly across the keyboard. Um, these days I'm a little bit more fast and loose with the when and how it happens. Uh, but definitely there are certain things. And um, I think the, that are important um, because they sort of, and this is something that I, I learned in my um, training both in yoga and in teaching, is that there are ways that you use a, a, a routine, a ritual, a set of movements if in the case of a yoga practice to help kind of prime your mind for mm -hmm. a specific thing, purpose, you want to calm down or to be focused or whatever. And so, yeah, I have de definitely found that there are certain ritual uh, uh, routines that I follow that will help me kind of um, speed jump me into the mode to write. And one of them is music. Um, I'm pretty... I mean, I don't spend a lot of time customizing a playlist because that also can slide into procrastination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I do, like, I'm, I'm always listening to music around the house and so I'm always kind of have an ear for whatever project that I'm working on and, like, a song that may trigger a thought about a character or a scene or something that I'm, that it is sometimes it's like a line or two or a bit of the, the music. Um, and I wish I could have a better... Uh, understanding of what that actually was, but it, it is. So I, you know, make, always make a point to like add that to a playlist. I kind of have a running set of playlists on Spotify that I just sort of add things to. And then when I sit down to write, I will often play that playlist as I'm drinking. Um, and if there are certain songs that work particularly for a scene or a chapter, I try to make it real quick because, you know, the process of writing a book and, and revising it and rewriting it and editing may take you six months, or even three months. It's a long period of time to try to get your mind back into that same place. Mm -hmm. So um, what I find that for me, music is very, very much kind of primes my brain to be in the place I was when I was listening to it the first time. Like there are uh, songs that I hear now that will remind me of being in a at a time of my life in high school, even, you right. know, where it's like, oh man, I just, I'm, all the senses come back, the smell of something or the feel of something or, um, so I do that with music writing very deliberately. So if I know there's a song that really, for me, attaches to a scene, um, as I'm editing, revising, I, oh, I will always try to find that song to kind of put me back in that zone. And so, yeah, I do have pretty specific playlists. I wind up at the end of a book with about me, if I that are um, kind of put me in a mood or action scene or like really, you know, about a relationship or there's a line of one song that I love so much um, that actually uh, became the opening for a scene in Dancer's Flame. Like I needed a scene for Azella and Azrael to have a quiet moment to kind of like sort some business out before they run off to go save the world. And there was this 
a line in a song by a group called The Overcoats, and it just was like exactly what I needed. And so, yeah, I use music. I, I rely, music is my biggest ritual, I would say. It, um, and the other things are just like, are, are some of them are kind of silly. I will sometimes draw a tarot card before I sit down with a new CD and it just sort of get my mind primed on symbolism and thinking of what, um, how you can use things in a non-obvious way to sort of cue the brain into some sort of direction that you need it to go. Um, stuff like that, but... Uh, I try not to be too specific and rigid about my rituals because I don't also want to stop myself from writing. Like I don't want to say, Oh gosh, I don't have everything just right. So I can't do my writing now. Right. Like I have to still be, you know, sit down and get the work done sometimes. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so what are you reading right now? Oh my gosh, I'm reading all the things. <laughs> uh, I'm so excited. I never read a one book at a time. I'm a, I am a, polygamous booker book reader <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if that's even if that applies um i tend to i'm actually right now i am redoing a reread of uh, roxanne gay's bad feminist and if you haven't ever read that um it's a wonderful book she's a wonderful writer and um, most of the book is essays that she's written for other people and it's all been collected and i think the book came out in 2014 um but I love her writing, and I love the way she takes pop culture very seriously as a writer. I think we have this way of, like, dismissing things that are popular, anything pop culture that gets to a certain level of successfulness. We dismiss it as not being serious or real. Or, um, and she has this wonderful way of kind of doing cultural critique. She does, you know, read and review um, straightforward lit fiction, but she also really looks at pop culture and I appreciate that and then particularly um, from the angle of feminism and how women are represented and are relate related to by our popular media so I love that one and that's one that they're all essays so you can pretty much pick up the book and read a couple and then put it down walk away for a month or two and read something else um, and then I am catching up on Beverly Jenkins um, she is one of she's the the grand lady of um, African-American romance, uh, specifically historical fiction. Uh, and she's wonderful. I think if you are looking to be introduced to historical romance that is not uh, set in Regency England, <laughs> she's the one to go to. She does uh, Civil War. She does post-Civil War. She does the West, all with very diverse characters and um, really interesting plots and so right now I'm reading Midnight, uh, and that is her novel that's set in the Revolutionary War about, um, and it's about a freed woman who uh, is participating with the colonists in the on the colonist side of the war. And so it's um, she's another one that just effortlessly includes race in her novels. So she's very aware of it and conscious of the history, um, but it's very naturally inserted, and it's very uh, and then there and she highlights periods of time where you don't often think of the contribution of people of color and um, writes these wonderful love stories about them and how people in all sorts of moments of history during conflict and war and um, bondage have still managed to find each other and fall in love and make families and all of those things. So I'm loving Midnight right now. That's been my fiction read. Uh, and then uh, my, my other book that I'm reading right now, <laughs> because I cannot have enough, uh, is one that had totally missed my radar and I don't know how. Like, this is exactly my catnip. Um, it's, she's basically like Indiana Jones, Laura Croft, the um, author is Sericia Glass, and the name of the book is called Shadow Blade. And so urban fantasy, hello, that's totally me. <laughs> uh, and she winds up involved with a supernatural creature, and I'm like, of course, this is me. <laughs> Uh, so I'm really excited about that one. This one has been the one that I've had to slow myself down so I don't finish it too fast. Um, and thankfully, there are two other books in the series out, so I can't wait to get to those two. Fun. Thank you. How about um, with your daughter, who's now three, what, do you, what are you and she reading together? Oh, the three major. Um, <laughs> basically, anything she wants. <laughs> I, will, sure. I will read her from the cereal box. Um, <laughs> she's uh, actually, it's really cool because like, now is the time where she's starting to pick up books on her own that we've read a lot. And she, I'll catch her sitting in the, in the corner, flipping the pages and telling herself the story. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, yes, 
it's happening. The reader is <laughs> becoming a reader. Um, but right now she's really into uh, superheroes because uh, the whole Batman, Superman thing started happening at school. And so DC um, Comics makes a series of kids' books that are girls, superhero girls. Um, and I love them, and she loves them, and she now can name all of the, the whole cast of the DC superhero. Oh, the Superwoman, and or Supergirl, and Batgirl, and Wonder Woman, and Katana, and, like, she knows them all, and I'm the, the geek, my little geek heart, mom heart is just exploding with joy right now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We read that. Yeah, and we're also reading... Um, finding a lot of books that are helpful for our socialization right now. One of my favorites is a book called Be Kind, and it's by Pat Zeitlow, um, and the illustrator is Jen Hill. And it's about two, uh, a child in the school, the kid, as we call the kid, um, learning, trying to understand what it means to be kind mm-hmm. in the world to other people. Um, so, you know, I, I try not to be too, like, prescriptive in my parenting but as long as I'm buying the books we're getting books that are <laughs> right. maybe have a little bit of a lesson in them yeah. right right is she still reading uh well she you you and she uh, are there still books in German oh yes we actually um are she is we have it's funny she knows the difference now from mommy books and daddy books you know she goes this is a papa book this is a mama book and like you shall ask him to read some of the books in English and he will he can I mean obviously he can read English but his preference for her is to read only in German and so he says oh no that's the mama book you got to save that for mama but she knows that he can translate some of them the simpler ones he can translate on the fly you know, so if she tries that with me and I'm getting I'm decent with some of the German, the, the kids, the very basic kids, German books I can read. Um, and apparently I'm pretty good. Uh, but uh, yeah, they're definitely, she's got a shelf of mom books and a shelf of papa books. And, and she knows which are which. Although there, I will say there is a great company now that does bilingual books. So um, we have a, a, my dear godmother sends them to her a couple of, they have one side of the, of the, they have the same story in English and in German. Oh, nice. And apparently you can, they have multiple languages, so you can do whatever configuration you want. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and, it's, and they're common stories. Some of the stories I've never heard of, but there was like Jack and the Beanstalk. And, um, and so basically we have, we have a subscription now to bilingual books, which is fantastic for me. And adults, if you're trying to read it, learn a language, get the children's books. Mm -hmm. I mean, don't start with the big stuff. If you are learning a second language, start with the kids' books. You will will find yourself learning so much so fast. That's my tip to anyone learning a second language. Um, Unsolicited advice from Jasmine. (laughs) That's what we comes you for. Thank you. Um, So Exactly. uh, You did mention uh, earlier that you have a website. So where can people find you on your website and social media, et cetera? Yeah, so um, hopefully this is pretty easy. I am at www.jasminesilvera.com. Easy enough. Uh, I am also on uh, Facebook and Instagram primarily. I dabble in Twitter occasionally, but I often run away screaming after about <laughs> 10 minutes. Um, and I, all of my social media is uh, at jazz, J-A-S-S-I-L-V-E-R-A, so Jazz Silvera. Um, I'm everywhere and I even put my Pinterest boards up. So if you're the kind of person that likes to know what an author thinks big characters look like, um, I have boards for all of the books up there and inspiration boards. Um, but definitely my big ones are Facebook and Instagram right now. Um, I also have a newsletter. If you are interested in giveaways, um, and finding out release information, you can sign up on the newsletter through the website. Um, and recently, we did start a Facebook group, and so that groups are different than pages because you uh, voluntarily join a group, and you, it's a little bit more of like a, I call it the party, uh, because it's a little more interactive than just a page where I'm throwing up, you know, hey, look, the book's on sale this week. Um, it's more, I is where I share my memes, and, you know, we goof off and ask questions and do little private giveaways. So there is a Facebook group, and that's called The Academy. Um, and that's connected to the pages. So, I mean, I know this is a lot to get over the ear. Uh, but, uh, yeah, if you even just start out at the Facebook page, Jazz Silvera, that will lead you to all the other places. Right. And, again, that will all be on the blog post. So if you don't want to fr- frantically try to write all this down, just 
go to our blog and yeah. you can click or you can go Put to down your pen, take a deep breath. We'll <laughs> That's, get right. It to you. <laughs> That's right. Um, well, we have talked about a lot, which is awesome. Um, as always, is there anything else that we haven't covered that you would like to talk about before we wrap things up? No, I just want to thank you again for having me. I mean, I write urban fantasy and romance because I love reading it and I love sharing that with readers and I love to hear from my readers. So um, definitely get in touch with me if you had any questions about the book. Um, as an author, especially as an indie author, I rely on reader reviews. And so if you have five minutes after you've read the book and you want to just throw down a sentence or two about what you thought of it on Amazon or Goodreads, that is an enormous benefit and a favor to me. I super appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And I just want to thank all the readers who have followed me through book one and to book two. And I really hope you enjoy it. So thanks again, Sarah, for having me. This oh, has you're been wonderful. And as for reviews, if you're someone like me who uh, overthinks everything, um, you actually have on your website uh, tips for writing reviews. Um, I was just looking at that last night. So if you don't know how to write a review or you don't know where to start, start at Jasmine's page and get some tips. Yeah, it doesn't have to be complicated. Literally, a sentence or two is perfect. Um, I always say, like, write it like a tweet. <laughs> and for those of you who are intimidated by Twitter, just keep it short. Sentence or two. Right. Uh, right. Yeah, and, you know, comparisons are great. If, it's, if you like this book because it reminds you of another book or an author that you love, mention that. If you don't like a book, mention why. I mean, that's super right. helpful because sometimes a book that I don't like, for whatever reason, maybe somebody else is catnip. So as long as you can be specific, even a review about a book that you weren't super crazy about can be helpful to the author. So, right. But be specific, um, and definitely not, to other readers. Yeah. Be specific, yeah, but yeah. Not, not mean. <laughs> like, don't just say, I hated right. this book. This it sucked. Worst, like, that's not helpful. This is the worst <laughs> book that I've ever read. Yeah. Well, that just doesn't help anyone. Like, hey, hey, I really don't care for books where the hero is involved with somebody else but when the book starts and then through the course of the book, he winds up with the heroine. Like that for me just rubs me the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So I, I always go into a review and I'm like, well, you know, this really isn't my thing and here's why. Right. Yeah. You know, so, right. but I did like this about it. You know, exactly. if, you, if you can pick out something that you did like, that's awesome too. But yeah, I mean, I just think like, um, readers, don't be intimidated by a by the product, the uh, prospect of leaving a review. Like it's not nobody expects you to like write uh, a novel on a novel. <laughs> um, but it, if you think of it as you're helping another reader um, find a book that they may love, uh, then you're doing a favor to the other readers you know, that are out there that are looking for great books too. So um, help other readers. Absolutely. And leave a little review. And yeah. if you love and an author, the author, if you love an author, then, you know, let them know. So, yeah, yeah. That's how we find out. Cause we're all writing in a bubble. We don't get to talk to you all the time. That's we don't right. know what you think. That's so, right. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. And I know you've got a busy week ahead of you. So um, enjoy the rest of your weekend. No, oh, thank you so much, too. It is sunny here in Seattle, so I'm going to take advantage of that. And uh, I hope that you, all of you, read on, read well. And um, it's great talking to you again, Sarah. Thanks for having me. No, you're welcome. Thanks for being here. Once again, thank you so much to Jasmine for being a guest on the podcast. I really love when she comes to chat because I have so much fun. I hope you had fun listening to the podcast. I hope you are now intrigued and want to read Dancer's Flame. I hope you will then enter our giveaway contest so that you can win a copy of Dancer's Flame. Here is how you do that. Very simple. Just go to our Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram pages. Those links are in the show description, as well as on our website, as well as on the blog post, where all of Jasmine's information will be as well. Go to Facebook, Twitter, or Tum excuse me, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram and comment on the post with episode 80. That's episode 80, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Comment and you will be entered into the contest to win a copy of a paper, a ba paperback copy of Dancer's Flame. You know you want to. Come on, free books. It's very exciting. I love to send them out into the world. So help me fulfill my love of sending books out into the world so that other people can read them. Please, do it for me. <laughs> so anyway, hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you will join me again on Thursday. We have a completely different genre on Thursday. So I will be speaking with 
author A.M. Wilson about his debut novel, Populous. It is post-apocalyptic. It is dystopian. It is very, very interesting. And I had a really interesting conversation with him about that book, about what went into writing that book, his inspiration, etc. So I hope you will join me for that. And um, that's Thursday's episode. Thank you again to Jasmine. Thank you again to my listeners for tuning in. I love spending time with you every week. I wish you could be here in the studio with me hanging out. I will see you again next time. But in the meantime, please go out and get yourself lost in a good book. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.